Hello. Hi, and welcome Hello. to another Sigma chat um, this afternoon at the uh, Cambridge Photo Week. Uh, my name's Steve, for those who don't know me out there, and uh, I work for Sigma UK. Uh, and joining us today, I'm very grateful to have uh, Holly Wren, who is uh, a Sigma ambassador, we're very pleased to say, and uh, also a professional photographer. So good to see you again, Holly. They, t they go hand in hand, those two, hopefully. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, no, it's good to see. It's a long time no see just because of the lockdowns, etc. We've not had the chance to uh, meet up recently, but you're keeping well? Yeah, very well, thanks. I've missed our little catch ups and getting to play with the yeah. gadgets that you bring me to look at. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I know. So, uh, I should imagine lockdowns impacted on, uh, on your life as a professional photographer. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And lots of people I've spoken to have had the same issues. So really, especially for people that photograph portraits like myself, uh, yeah. the social distancing obviously adds an extra challenge. It's still possible, but it's more difficult. Um, and it's just really like the clients in terms of wanting to commission things in this time when you have to be so much more careful about your distance and who you're photographing and whether they're at risk. And yeah. I guess yeah. a large part of it is if it can be put off, it will be put off. There's mm. some stuff that has to happen and that goes ahead anyway, especially with kind of newspapers and magazines uh, where they can't buy pictures that were pre-taken, pre-owned. But yeah, it's really, especially portrait photographers hit hard. I think actually a lot of product photographers have done quite well at this time because of course they can have the things sent to their house, they can shoot at home yeah. or in a studio so they don't need to be around other people. But if you're shooting so other people, it's, it's difficult exactly. to hold them. Yeah, so the impact not so great on that type of photography, but very much an impact on your own. Yeah, Yeah, indeed, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. so, you are a, a portrait specialist. Yes, I. W yeah. when people ask, I just say I, I shoot people, but that sounds terrible because I don't <laughs> shoot people, I photograph people. Uh, but everything I do involves involves photographing a person in some way or another. So that's either quite static portraits or more of the kind of lifestyle portraiture, which is, for me, a portrait that uh, is more about a product or telling a story mm -hmm. through a portrait as opposed to a straightforward headshot or head and shoulders or image of somebody yeah. on their own. Right. Well, we, we'll have a, I've got some some of your shots to look at shortly, and maybe you'd better talk us through the, the scenarios with those briefly. But Yeah, sure. But, but what actually got you into photography in the first place? Was, was it the... the uh, the photography and, and the equipment or was it your imagination and I mean what actually threw you into it from from those early days? Uh, so originally actually when I was a kid my granddad was really into photography um, uh -huh. and so we grew up a lot around going to his house and he had a projector and he used to project yeah. images that he'd taken on and the slides. wall yeah. Uh, yeah, in slides and he would talk us through the image like why it was a good photograph now he was he was relatively I was relatively young when he passed away so I don't remember the detail of that but no. I know he was really into cameras and I remember looking at pictures on the wall with him and as such my dad had a camera and took his camera on and my dad liked to take pictures so I used to go up my dad and photograph when and this was when I was really young probably like before I was 10 years old no. and then I kind of you know went to school and found all the things you do at school and kind of left photography behind and when I was about 17 or 18 uh, just before I went to university, I was given a camera and right. at university I took a few pictures and I had them on my wall, uh, just, you know, horrible student digs, yeah. put anything on the wall to make it look better. Yeah, course, I, was, yeah. I had these pictures that I'd taken and I stuck them on the wall and people used to come in and they thought they were postcards I'd bought from somewhere. So I was uh -huh. like, oh, well, if they don't think I took them, they must be okay. Yeah, um, exactly. So I started kind of... When I started out, actually, I did more sort of abstract, and mm -hmm. I went to Leeds University. I actually studied business management, so nothing to do with photography at all. Right. And I used to take pictures of like flowers or like macro-y type of things, things that I could imagine that I would put on my wall or that I thought were pretty. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't until later that I found portraiture, but it was kind of more having, I guess, the eye for it. Like I used to walk around and see pictures, so. Mm -hmm. If I went somewhere, I'd think, oh, that would make a good picture or that would be a good framing or how yeah. nice is the light here? And once you start thinking like that, I think yeah. that you, when you becoming professional or you are professional, you start to see everything in that way. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it was more the sort of creative side of it, I think, that pulled me into so, so it's the creative side of it that you suddenly you thought you had a passion for 
before you then start into moving to the more technical side and, and what that brings to it as well. Yeah, and yeah. it was more about it was a it was a hobby, you know. And then I had a I had a proper a proper job, uh, uh -huh. working in an office, and I was a I worked in actually land buying for a development company. And at night, uh, I used to do a night course in actual film, black and white photography. Right. Where yeah. we used to develop our own film, and, and yeah. again, it was just for fun. But that really gave me like a discipline of getting things right in camera because of course when you shoot film and you've only got 35 shots sure. and also you only go once a week to develop them there's mm -hmm. nothing more frustrating than getting in a dark room shaking up your little thing and then realizing mm -hmm. that they're all crap because exactly. then you've got only another week to go back and do it again so you become very good at doing it right in camera basically yeah. or you try to get as good as possible at doing it right in camera excellent so uh obviously we met through your well, through the fact that you had some Sigma product is how we met and, uh, originally. Yeah. So was there one specific Sigma lens that, that you sort of like leaped on in those earlier days that you thought this is something that is really useful to me? Yeah, so interestingly, I had the 35 mil for a while, the Sigma, um, right. because the default had always been, because I started shooting on uh, Nikon and I had some Nikon lenses I bought from somebody and then I kind of replaced those with more Nikon lenses. And uh, that was just my default, really. And it was yeah. the only one I'd ever considered using. And then I was needed to buy a 35 mil. And actually, the Sigma was slightly cheaper than the Nikon in that situation. Right. And because it's not a focal length, I use that often. I, I bought the Sigma lens, but I didn't use it that much. So I didn't really appreciate the beauty of the Sigma art lenses. Right. <laughs> and so the real changeover for the moment for me was I had um, a 50 mil Nikon lens, which I'd had probably for like a good five years. And yeah. when I started out shooting, I'd bought an 85 mil Nikon and I thought maybe I'd add a 50 mil to it, but I didn't think I'd use the 50 mil that much. So I bought a second hand <laughs> one and turned out I used it all the time, like constantly, mm -hmm. I loved the 50 mil. And so when it was about to die, I went uh, to the camera shop and said, it's gonna die. They gave me a quote to mend it. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just replace it because I use it so much. And they said, well, before you do that, why don't you just take the Sigma art for a, uh, kind of a run and I was like well I mean I, I, why would I do that like I can get a Nikon and I thought they were selling it me because they were like oh maybe maybe I thought it was cheaper or there was there was some benefit that was that I wasn't seeing and they were like no it's actually more expensive and I was like oh that's interesting <laughs> <Wait a minute. laughs> yeah so I was like I'm not sure why I want to take this Sigma out so anyway I took it because I was given it to try and basically I fell in love with it Brilliant. and I suddenly realized the beauty of the Sigma mm. art lenses, even though they kind of, they've been in my periphery. I've done a few um, talks at the photography show and yeah. uh, for Profoto and Nikon. And I, I looked at the Sigma art lenses in the photography show, but just not really like understood, I guess how great they were because it's one of those mm. things that if you don't try it, you don't, mm. I mean, you can read right. all the right. on and people talking about yeah. stuff, but really you have to put it on your camera and give it a go and that for me I had like this real kind of like aha moment and I was like, oh, yeah, exactly. now I've got to buy this more expensive lens. <laughs> <laughs> but so, what, yeah, you, what, what you found out there was was how Sigma's direction very much changed when we launched Global Vision products which is when you then got into that 35mm. The 35mm art was a new series for us and it was the launch of us into a new direction and a new path. Uh, and no one could really believe at the time just how great those art lenses are. I mean, yeah, uh, they're, they're incredible. Just absolutely outstanding. Um, and the you know, it's interesting with Sigma because you guys put so, you know, you are lenses and you put so much into making these, you know, crazy beautiful lenses. Mm. And obviously Nikon and Canon and those kind of companies are slightly more focused I would say on the bodies than they are the lenses and so you yeah, get these yeah. bodies but the lenses almost don't keep up with the bodies yeah. because I mean if you look at um Ken Rockwell's site I always find that really interesting because he tells you everything about every lens and I think the 50 mil 1.4 Nikon or whatever was last updated in something like 1984 or, or something like that because those kind of prime lenses don't need as big a updates as the zooms do but actually when you've got camera bodies that are getting better and better and better you need the lenses that kind yeah. of really showcase those bodies and i think for me that's that's what i found about the the 50 mil with the sigma yeah. so that was kind of my first it was the launch into, yeah exactly exactly yeah. and it, to this day is the 50 mil now a lens that you still fall back on a lot then uh yeah yeah the yeah. 50 mil is 
is one of so it's interesting because it's probably not the most beautiful lens out of all of them it doesn't you know perform in the most beautiful way but i absolutely love the focal length of the 50 mil as a yeah. lens um yeah. i love that it's really as wide as you can get before you start losing your straight lines because i'm a bit of a straight line obsessor um and i find it's just an all-round like just a great lens to have if i if i go out uh a city uh, for a weekend abroad or something i generally walk around with the 50 mil lens on yeah, because i find sure. i can use it to take portraits i can use it to take street scenes people find yeah. that strange they're always like would well, you not want something wider and i'm like well i don't mind something wider but i yeah. feel like there's so much to be gained light wise and quality from the prime lenses that mm -hmm. i'd almost rather walk around with a 50 and then maybe like a 24 or something or a 19 like completely separate than have a, a zoom lens on my camera right. so 50 mil yeah. is kind of my go-to i would say yeah. okay right well i'll tell you what we need to do because time will keep marching on otherwise but let, let's have a because i could chat we could chat all afternoon but i'm sure people have got other things to do after they've seen us as well but but um I want oh, it's to there's nothing to do <laughs> yes very true apart from getting the gin out i don't know is it too early the uh it's after five o'clock i think everyone's right. got a different time zone for that haven't they but yeah we'll see um so i'm gonna pick up a, i'm just gonna pick at random some of the images that i've got here maybe you can uh enlighten us a little bit so that people can get an idea of the type of photography that yeah, you do yeah. I'm um, so i'm gonna grab one at random me about them. i understand what you want to hear about them there we go look there's two for a start so yeah uh, so well, the one on the left there, that's somebody I recognise, isn't it? Yeah, it's Gabby Roslin, the TV. Gabby Roslin, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, is that something else I think you do? Don't you get involved in a bit of celebrity photography? I do, and that image was actually used on the front cover of Prima magazine. I think it might be actually a different frame to that one where she's looking at camera. Um, right. It was originally shot. This is actually an interesting uh, break uh, breakdown. Lockdown. Maybe there was a breakdown in lockdown, but this is lockdown. <laughs> lockdown. Yeah. Lockdown. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this was shot actually for a trainer brand called Air and Grace um, uh -huh. before lockdown and. Uh, it, you can't see the trainers in the shot, admittedly. This was just a, a shot we took of Gabby herself. And what happened was then we went into lockdown and Prima were due to shoot uh, with Gabby for a front cover. And basically yeah. it was all canceled because we were put into lockdown. And Gabby absolutely loved these images. So she got her agent to contact me. Well, I think Gabby might have emailed me herself and just said that they absolutely loved the images and they were looking for one for Prima. So would I mind being in put in touch with the magazine to see if they could buy them off me to use them in the magazine? Uh -huh. um, because their shoot had been canceled. So this was, there was not very many images actually where we didn't have the shoes in the shot. Um, right. But this was one of them. So they used one of these images more. I think actually the one they used on the front was her looking to camera. Uh, but the same framing to oh. on the front of the, of the magazine. And this was actually taken in the trainer shop in London. So, oh, yeah, it's actually that curtain at the back hides the office. So behind that curtain is trainers and people and uh, desks and mess and everything that goes along with like right. actual work. So we, we shut that curtain and use just the white wall and the light that you see, the kind of pinky tone of light is using um, a flash to basically light up that back curtain. It was it was kind of a sheer curtain. So we right. added a, a gel on it to create a do, bit of a pink tone do, for the back. Do you prefer natural environments to a, a full sort of studio setup or? Do you tend to combine both, or what? prefer is a strong word because <laughs> because when you're in a when you're in a studio, you obviously have the benefit of being able to control everything. When you work environmentally, then you have what's coming at you. So whether that be the location, the light, uh, the mess, uh, yeah. the lack of light, too much light, so everything is kind of different changes, and it's yeah. changing all the time. So I would say my expertise is 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 in environmental portraits. So being able to go into any location and make that location work, be able to mm -hmm. make a shot out of that location mm -hmm. um, and to be able to change the light, to influence the light, to use the light. So yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what I do and I like the yeah. challenge of that, but uh, it's not necessarily easier than working in the studio. In no. fact, it's often a lot harder, but then you get the story behind the right. person or behind the location. Or sometimes you don't. Like that shot you just showed, the one on the right is taken in someone's home with just a, a basic uh, 
cream wall in the background, like a, a magnolia wall in someone's front room. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was like the set, the set up with the with the light and the color was done just with two umbrellas in, in yeah. a front room, but that could well be in a studio. And I think people often forget that you can really use anywhere as a studio if you're if you're cropped tight enough or you can put a background up and you've got enough space. So exactly. Yeah. You yeah. Need to hire so, expensive studios to create images. Can you I, I you I don't know how long ago you took these now, but could you remember which lens you took these with? Uh yep. Yeah. So on the left is with the eighty five no, the fifty mil. Uh-huh. And the one on the right with the gels, colour gels, is yeah. using the 105. It was the 105, yeah, the large Bocca Master, as it's called. It's an absolute animal. It's a beast, isn't it? Both in weight and in results. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have a picture of it for anybody who's not familiar with it. Let's see if I think I have. There we go. That's the beast. It doesn't do it justice because that was like it. Any it, needs, it needs something of scale in there. We need to put a 50 pence piece or something into give it a bit of scale. Yeah, or just I'm sure there's loads of pictures on my Instagram of me holding it and it's like as big as my head. So, <laughs> uh, my head is pretty big, so that says it, something. It's a phenomenal piece of glass, though, isn't it? But, oh, yeah. I thought it's unbelievable. And actually, it's funny that the, the model in that picture she was like, I can literally see myself in the lens because it's right. so big and like you're looking down this lens, it's massive. <laughs> I've skipped, I've just, I, I nearly sneaked it up just now so I might have seen it. These these caught my eye. What What's happening here? So this is in um, the Florida Keys in Key West. Right. And these ladies are drag queens working at a bar called uh, 801 Bourbon. Uh-huh. And um, basically, this was interesting because we organized an entire shoot based around doing sort of like a fashion style shoot outside. So mm -hmm. very bright blue skies with flash looking kind of upwards, like very kind of vogue um, but with these amazing drag queens that right. were, I guess, like a, a little bit. They're not like, you know, high-end drag. It's kind of like slightly tacky. And, and actually that's yeah, one of the things yeah. I enjoyed most about it because it real, feels real more and more real. Yeah. And actually the one day we'd planned to do this, it poured down with rain. Um, so I was there for about two weeks and the one day of the shoot, the heavens opened and it rained. So uh, we had a plan B and this was plan B, which was to uh, go inside. So this, these are both taken inside the uh, bar where they perform. Right. Yeah. Um, and I had very, very minimal kit with me, one one light uh, and a, uh, my 50, this was on the 50 mil Sigma lens. So yeah. I was working with the minimal equipment um, and got these, I mean, I love these ladies. The lady on the uh, left is, I think, 80 years old. Really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely incredible. A turn Thank by you. day, drag queen by night. Unbelievable, isn't it? But yeah, so I mean, was that from a professional point of view? How did how did you get that sort of commission to to do that? That's exactly that a personal project. So uh -huh. I have a very bad habit of turning every holiday into a photography project. Right, <laughs> so I was down. Well, actually, I was shooting some work for Hertz in Florida, and I was traveling down through the Florida Keys and uh, in Key West with my stepmom and I didn't realize that Key West was famous for drag queens. Right. So when I was doing my kind of, I always tend to research whenever I'm going on holiday and see if there's any kind of portrait project I can come up with. And when yeah. I found out it was famous for drag queens, I was like, that's amazing. So I actually just uh, found these guys on Instagram, well, the people who ran the bar and I emailed yeah. them and or direct messaged them and asked them if they would be willing to have their pictures taken. And of course they get a lot of, people asking that so normally they yeah. charge people to do this with them but uh i sort of referred to my work with them and asked them if they'd be willing to do it and not make me pay um so, and they very okay. kind of gave their time so we yeah i was gonna say so obviously where you fill things that are of your own private time with with images of this nature is it, uh, it i guess that all helps with regards to your portfolio anyhow and how that might help you get other jobs and things in the future as well yeah, I mean, there's, 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 it's kind of two prong, really. One of them is, you know, you shouldn't be practicing on a shoot for your client. You should know what you're doing. And also, um, you know, people want to see who you are as a photographer and how you shoot and how you like to shoot and the things that you like to shoot. And mm -hmm. so the joy of shooting for yourself in a personal project is that it's completely your design. So how they're shot, how they're lit, um, 
the expressions on people's faces there's no there's no brief it's completely up to me it's my brief and so yeah. that shows potential clients exactly who I am as a photographer and how I like to shoot it might give clients ideas for images mm -hmm. um, but the other side of it is that I just love photography like I was a, I was a hobbyist before I was a professional and so there was a big joy for me in taking photographs I genuinely love taking photographs so I think that's that, that's where the fit worked for us with Sigma as well because as we outlined when you came on board for us it and we're so grateful you did because it's the passion and the energy and everything that you project uh, along with the skill that you produce in the images you produce as well that it's all of that combination that 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 attracted us to having you on board as an ambassador as well, because it's where Sigma is headed and what we're trying to achieve. You know, we're, we're all about passion and energy and producing product that, that fits the needs of, of the people that are using it. And yeah, and like I, you know, I've only ever worked with uh, brands who I actually believe in the product of and the people, yeah. the products that I actually use. And I think it's important as an ambassador to be to be really honest you know mm. to to understand why a product's great but why maybe another product might be a better fit for somebody exactly. else yeah, yeah. and just to be honest about it because i can't go out and create the images that i love unless i'm using products i love because mm. otherwise i'm going to default to something else which is dishonest mm. you know i genuinely use these lenses in my spare time as well as yeah. when i'm doing commissions and i would not want to go and shoot a commission with someone with something that was substandard so you, you know you, you really have to believe in what you're using and so for me it's not a hardship to be an ambassador because i'm just telling you know i'm just telling the truth this is, yeah. this is what i use and what i do and yeah, yeah i absolutely i absolutely love photography and so doing that kind of project for me is just a joy because <laughs> Anyone that is a professional and aspiring to be a professional realizes that you know you're not always going to shoot the things that you love shooting. You're not always uh, going to get the dream commissions. You're going to uh, have to do jobs that you hate or that don't pay very well or where the talent's an absolute pain in the ass. Or you come away and you're like, oh, that was awful. And so for me, the reason I am a photographer is because I love photography. So if I don't go out and do those things off my own back that I love, it's easy to forget why you love it. And like yeah. so, so doing that stuff first of all, warms your soul and makes you feel yeah, good and, does, and yeah. makes you realise why you're a photographer. But the other side of it is that, of course, that forms a big part of my portfolio and it shows people how I want to shoot and who I am as a photographer and the kind of things yeah. I enjoy shooting and how I like lighting them without yeah. the restraints of a brief. But let's grab another image and have another. I'll just, again, I'll pick one at random and see what we've got. Here we go. So there's another <laughs> example of me... Uh, doing something for fun so this oh. was turning up a whole day a whole day into a photo shoot uh, much to the uh, despair of my uh, boyfriend on this one who became my assistant and while we were stood in this uh, tea field he was just complaining about the fact that there were snakes but um, I, was yeah. too, I was too worried about getting a shot so this is <laughs> again well that's the passion of a photographer though isn't it yeah why worry about some snakes He's like, Holly, be careful, the snakes. I was like, yeah, it'll be fine. I just need to get the right angle. Yeah. I get bitten, but I get an amazing shot. Who cares? It's a lovely um, natural image, isn't it? It really is. Great character. Yeah, that was just nice. in the middle of the tea fields uh, in a tea estate. And that was incredibly difficult light, actually, because you can see behind there is some midday sun, you know, coming mm -hmm. in through there that's really, really intense. And so... Changing. Yeah. yeah, the exposure difference between the shadows and, and that kind of hard light under the trees is, is difficult to deal with. So the light on her face there is actually a reflector. So we took a reflector yeah. and tried to not blind her with the, uh, yeah. with the light. Keep it, still, keep it still natural. Yeah, exactly. And make it look nice Very and natural. natural. And I'm just going to grab another or we'll skip on to another quick as well. These, these are wonderful characters, these two. Yeah, they're amazing. So these guys were uh, the same place. So this was in the uh, Herman's Tea Estate in Sri Lanka. And mm. again, that you know, I emailed the guy that owned the estate and said, "I'm a photographer. This is what I've done. This is what yeah. I do. Would you would you allow me to come along and and kind of direct me to people that I can photograph?" So it was quite funny because they want they had a few of the tea the tea pickers to photograph, and I actually said, "Oh, well, can you get me as many as possible?" Because <laughs> You know, for, as a photographer, you, you, you don't know who's going to have that amazing face that you want. Or, you know, the lady on the, left, the right is a, is a, is a particular favourite of mine because her yeah. eyes are incredible and her hair and she's just beautiful. Um, but they basically lined up probably the best part of about 40 <laughs> people for me. So 
we so I was thinking I can't pick out the ones I want because that's quite insulting so I need to just photograph everybody so uh basically they came in and they had about you know two seconds in front of the camera mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. while they were I mean I use a light on this so we're using a pro photo light here uh this was this was with the 105 so how I was it uh, we, poking in. yeah we should appreciate that that is a very heavy lens to take all the way <laughs> to yeah, true. yeah that's true you did well with that you did really well to that about but it produced an incredible i mean these i mean the, the, just the, the the life you can see in their faces there is just it tells a story it's amazing great yeah, shots, shots. really them. really good yeah, they're, they're really good, they are. But again, that, that tenacity that you, you're talking about there, that, again, I think is anyone that's aspiring to be a professional photographer, I think to have your sort of t tenacity and, and drive to want to get images of like that, even if you're not being paid for them, you're doing it because you want to, and again, it's going to help build towards whatever you have in the future as well when you're producing images like that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, and there's a real argument around, you know, what, what work should you do for free or not do for free? And I think... For me, not being paid is not the same as not getting something out of it. So doing something yeah. for free doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting paid. There can be some other benefit to you. And I think yeah. that's what you have to remember. And, you know, people, um, other photographers I know always sort of joke with me about how much stuff I do, like off my own back and for free, etc. And it is, for me, a really important part of keeping up my passion, but also... Mm. Um, doing what I love and the thing is when you first start and you ask these people for example those drag queens if I didn't have a reputation or a portfolio they might have said well actually we'll do it with you but you need to pay us and yeah. then I would have to decide whether I thought paying them you know fifty dollars a person or whatever was worth it for the content for me which it may well be mm. of course as you kind of work your way up and your portfolio gets better and better what you get to do for free gets better and so yeah. um it kind of never seems fair, you know, to work for free. But I think you've got to think about it not just as working for no money, it's working for no benefit. So sure. if I have a client come along and say, oh, we've got this job, can you do it for free? We can give you a load of great contacts. And then I might be like, well, no, I don't need that in my portfolio. But of course, back mm -hmm. when I started, there was things mm -hmm. that I did for free that I wouldn't do for free now because the benefit may have been, I want to be, if I wanted to be a, an event photographer, and I never shot an event, if I can get into an event and shoot it for yeah. free, then of yeah. course the benefit to me is that I have those images then for my portfolio to sell myself to somebody else who needs an event yeah. So I think you kind of have to constantly review it um, and change it. And yes, yeah, sometimes I think, it is. I think a it's a really good takeaway for anybody that might be watching this that's thinking about turning professional. I think that's a really good point that you've made about how you kind of uh, build that portfolio and, and, and learn. And learn from being on the job. Everyone yeah, exactly. learns. I, I have a phrase about, I think I might have said it to you before, I often, I often use it. Every day's a school day. It doesn't matter how old you are, whatever job you're in, whatever you're doing, every day's a school day and, and you can always learn something. And, and, and that's obviously what you'll continue to do as you go through your continued path as a photographer. So, yeah, and, and people don't need to think that just because they started, like, that they're working for free but the rest of us don't yeah. because you know you do it all the way up you just your ambitions of what you're willing to shoot for free get you know more and more and more and more yeah. you know uh, shooting celebrities you might have to spend time shooting celebrities for free uh mm. in order to be able to shoot celebrities on a commission so exactly. yeah. there's always that kind of thing in photography which is a bit frustrating but it there's this thing that if you haven't shot something you're not capable of shooting something yeah. which we all know is not true it's like somebody wants a picture of an apple and you've got a picture of an orange in your portfolio, they say, oh, I don't think you can shoot an apple because we've only seen you shoot an orange. Exactly. And they're like, well, it's the same thing. It's just orange and not green. Yeah. And they go, no, sorry, now we need somebody who's shot an apple to shoot this apple for us. So, yeah. it, you know, there's there's kind of always that thing that it's like a chicken or an egg. So I think yeah. going out and shooting every, what you can, not everything, you know, within your specialism, shooting what you can and getting that experience is never, it's never really going to be a bad thing for you. Mm, mm, yeah, that's a good point. Really good point. Yeah, I like that. We'll do one more image because um, we, well, well, we're conscious of the time, about 30 minutes here. So okay. I'll just let's pop this one up because this is a little bit. This isn't a portrait. No. So they are, they were what was <laughs> that? Sorry, Polly. You have. That's not a person. Yeah. There is no person in that picture. Um, <laughs> that was shot for Hertz. 
um, and that was mm -hmm. over in, well, the one on the right is in Miami, yeah. and the one on the left is uh, Penny Camp State Park, I think that's what uh -huh. it's called. Um, yeah, they were both shot for her, so no, no people in sight. No, I can see that. I know. Thanks to change for you there, did it? Very, very much change. And that's again, that was on the 50 mil. So very yeah. straight lines. Yeah, very much a go to lens that 50 mil, isn't it? Yeah, and I had to back up quite far because obviously, with when you're not using a zoom, you have to actually use your feet and walk around. But yeah, yeah. I, I really like doing that. I like moving around. So yeah, yeah. I think where well, you've got the opportunity to walk backwards and not use a zoom, that's normally my preference. It's, and the lighting's so good on those as well, isn't it? With the, was that late in the day or early in the day? I mean, you can tell by the shadows, shadows it's pretty much sun over uh, the shot on the right oh, yeah. and the left. Oh, right. Sun, sun pretty much, it's probably like two o'clock in the afternoon, like absolutely blasting, you know, sunshine. Usually not the most friendly to shoot people in, maybe that's why there's cars in this. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very sharp shadows, very, very... Uh, high sun yeah. and high, very yeah. intense. Yeah. Not the kind of sun you get in the UK. No, no, very much so. No, already at the moment. <laughs> um, and then coming on to uh, new products. I just wanted because I think, if I remember rightly, you were sent one of our newest lenses recently, the 105 macro. Indeed, yes. I had I had a little fun trip out with that yesterday. Did you? Did you? Now, optically, the the, the product itself. Give us an honest opinion. What did you think? I mean, I was actually quite surprised because obviously I work with the the 105 full frame um, yeah. and that thing's an absolute beast. So I wasn't expecting to get such a, a great image out of basically a lens that's probably half the size and a third of the price. Maybe <laughs> that's yeah. like my honest opinion. I, can't, I yeah. kind of subscribe to you get what you pay for. So yeah. um I, yeah, I mean, I, I was shooting with the mirrorless, which is something I'm not mm -hmm. used to. So I think that it, kind of overtook we, my experience. Uh, yeah, I think we, we did mention earlier on, didn't you, your um, Nikon full frame, aren't you? Yeah. yeah so exactly. I was shooting with the mirrorless Sigma FP. And yeah. so that was like, you know, when you start using a Mac from using a PC, I was just, my mind was blown just trying to use yeah. like a different system. It so is. I think I, I got slightly overtaken with that. And um, obviously, looking at it on the back of the camera, you can't really appreciate the image you're going to get out the other side. Yeah, and yeah. then when I loaded them today, I was like, "What?" I was Excellent. like, "This is like crazy." I, Good I, I, and also, you know, most people use that lens for macro, so I yeah. did know my Instagram research and had a look at the tags on the 105 macro and yeah. bugs and yeah. bees and. Yeah hours so i kind of had no expectation thinking because sigma said you know take it out try a portrait yeah, with it. let's see what you can do and i was thinking oh okay but i used the 105 so it made sense yeah um so yeah that was that was um, a very... glad you like that. See, and as we said in the earlier as we was chatting honest is important to us as a brand as well so we'd have taken whatever feedback you give it and we've done it live on here so i'm glad it came out the right way for us but uh it's yeah, I, I did actually send the shot over for you guys to have a look at, but I don't think oh, you've to show on here. Yeah. But, but that's one of our DGDM products, so it's full-frame mirrorless products, as you said. So, and, and the optical quality that Sigma are bringing into those products is just incredible. It's They're matching, if not outperforming, some of our art, original art lenses. Yeah, I mean, I, I would very, very happily take that lens yeah. now if I went back to the tea farm. Uh, tea, yeah, really. farm, estate, yeah. farm tea. Really? I, I they're farming tea, aren't they? Surely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I very happily take that back and shoot those images that you saw before, but on that camera. I don't. I don't know. Excellent. I don't know if you'd see the difference in the two lenses. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, we're we, we're coming up to what just over thirty minutes now. So I just got a little bit of housekeeping. I quickly want to do for those that are watching that are enjoying the. Uh, the Cambridge event. I'm going to pop this up just to remind people that that we're offering free filters with uh, with lenses purchased during this week. So uh, it might be something worth looking at if uh, anyone's interested in any of the lenses that we've uh, we spoke about today whilst we've been having our chat. So that's something to think about. That's good um, because those filters cost a blooming for They do. I know. So it's a real yeah. yeah I mean, you think you spent enough money on a lens? Someone wants yeah. hundred quid for a filter. You're like what? 150 quid for the 105 there yeah for 156 so, yeah. yeah yeah so so that's a nice little bonus for anybody that's watching for that 
Um, if, to kind of summarise, if, if, if anybody's watching that's interested in, in getting into professional photography, I, I don't know what put you on the spot, but is there one thing maybe you could say, look, this is something to just think of if you're getting into this line of work, you know, that would be something they could take away from it? I would say... Is it that having that passion and that drive and... Yeah, I think, things I think having the passion and drive is so important because you know, it's so competitive being a professional yeah. photographer. I've been doing it for eight years, a bit more, mm -hmm. and there's still months where I worry about, you know, how I'm going to make the rent payments. Well, well, that was going to be my next. That was going to be my next question. Really, is, is as we summarise now. Obviously, we're coming hopefully out of a pandemic next year. It's going to be a little bit easier for us all, but. Are you already getting things lined up for next year? Or yeah, is it so I ha yeah, so people are asking me about things. You know, there's, yeah. there's an unfortunate, I was going to shoot an advert for a, a charity for Christmas, but it was with elderly people. So that's obviously on the back burner for now because yeah. I can't be walking into elderly people's houses and putting them at risk. Um, but I think, yeah, I think being very passionate, you need to have it because you might not make a load of money out of this you might make a load of money out of it yeah. but you might yeah. not make a load of money and so you've got to have that desire like that you know mm. that passion to fall back on otherwise you're yeah. very quickly gonna come unstuck yeah. and i think the other big bit of advice would be would just be go out and take pictures like take yeah. pictures make mistakes and then learn from your mistakes because mm. if you're not constantly doing that and practicing and pushing yourself and trying new techniques me yesterday trying this mirrorless camera like getting really yeah. angry with myself that I couldn't just pick yeah. up a new bit as fast as my normal one if I didn't do that then I wouldn't be able to turn up on another job and use it easily so I think you have to just constantly make mistakes and learn from your mistakes and mm -hmm. analyze your work and analyze other people's work yeah exactly yeah good well popped up your Instagram there so if anybody wants to find out more about you and what you're doing your portfolio then they can have a little look on that as well but it's been an absolute pleasure again today holly thanks for your time thanks um, sorry sorry we, we didn't have a gin and tonic on this i know well i think what's the time we have oh, well it's now what 26 is it so in my eyes that's gin and cock gin, gin time now so that's next on the list for me but no it's been an absolute pleasure as always hopefully next time we get to meet again it will be uh, under different circumstances uh, than online but um but i yeah. hope it's been instructive to people watching today so been an absolute pleasure seeing you again so with that we'll sign off take care of yourself Thanks, um, and uh yeah everyone watch yeah enjoy the rest of the cambridge event and uh hopefully we'll see you all soon so take care Thank Cheerio. You.